from Taiwa News and Views. My name's Joe Balkum. I'm the host of the program. Thanks for joining us. You know, when I want to know what the weather is, I watch the Weather Channel because the Weather Channel has the weather, and I know a lot of people are into the weather, and I'm into the weather. It's one of my favorite things to do is watch the Weather Channel. But when I want to learn about local and state issues of interest to progressives in Iowa, I tune into Iowa News and Views. So Weather Channel's good for weather. Iowa News and Views, good for keeping up on local and state political issues happening around our state. So thanks for being with us. We have an interesting program tonight. We're going to delve into uh, issues surrounding access to the courts and the justice system here in Iowa. And w with us tonight as our guest is Roxanne Barton Conlon. Roxanne has a long history of both uh, legal and in involvement. She's an attorney as well as political involvement in our state. I want to tell you a few things about her as I introduce her tonight. Roxanne was an assistant attorney general with the state of Iowa heading the civil rights division in that section and working on race and sex discrimination uh, a number of years ago. She's also was appointed by former President Jimmy Carter as a federal prosecutor, uh, one of the uh, first two women ever to hold that position. And she was uh, a U.S. Attorney General in the Southern District in Iowa. Uh, Roxanne has uh, been trained at the Drake Law School. That's where she got her degree. She also has a, a degree from Drake in public administration. Um, she's also been active in, in politics. Um, she's been involved in Polk County politics. She's been involved in state democratic politics. Um, she was the first chair of the Iowa Women's Political Caucus in Iowa and also is an inductee into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, many of you will remember in 1982, Roxanne ran for uh, the governor of the state of Iowa and lost uh, narrow, in, a, in a narrow defeat uh, in 1982. Roxanne, we're pleased to have you with us. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on here. The show. Currently, Roxanne is a partner in Conlin and Associates Law Firm in Des Moines, uh, practicing law there in a, in a number of di different ways. Roxanne, you've had a very successful legal, uh, professional career and, and political career as well. What made, what has it's motivated nice of you to say that? But I lost that race for you, governor. You well, recall, you, you, I was first uh, runner up. That's good. <laughs> what motivates you? I mean, you're you've been an advocate for a number of different causes. What 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 fires you up? You know, that's a very hard question. I think for any of us to mm -hmm. answer about ourselves. I think what motivates me is a real affection for people and a belief in the efficacy of individual action. I think people do make a difference. I think I can make a difference and you can make a difference and I think that's why we're here. Great. One of the things that I think w when I look at some of your work, there was a recent article in Trial Magazine, the August edition of that, which is an article written by you about some of your, your recent, not so recent, but some of your cases in representing women in particular that have been uh, the victims of sexual harassment in the workplace, and I know it's an area of interest of yours legally. Um, how, how, tell us a little bit about a couple of these cases. Those were so difficult to choose, like every article. It, had to, it couldn't be 150 pages long, which is what I would have preferred. So I chose four of my clients to write about. Uh, the woman who was the first woman patrol officer in the history of the state of Iowa, a woman named Phyllis Henry, who they tried to kill in the course of her service as a police officer. And the happy ending is she is now United States Marshal for the Southern District of Iowa, the first woman to hold that position. I represented a woman that you and I both know who was a victim of stranger rape, a man came through her window in her apartment um, in the middle of the night and raped her. And the window through which he came was broken. And she had complained about it in writing three times, and numerous times also orally. And we sued the landlord for letting that rape happen and, were, and achieved a successful result. And the last two cases that I wrote about, one involves a woman uh, Linda Channon, who sued UPS after 23 years of a very successful career. She was the victim of a sexual assault in the workplace. And instead of being supportive of this long-term worker, the company punished her and treated her adversely in many, many significant ways. And ultimately, a jury, after looking at that, decided 
that punitive damages in a huge amount, surprising even to me, were, uh, were necessary to teach UPS uh, how to treat good, long-term, loyal women workers. Mm -hmm. And finally, the case involving a 29-year-old butcher who works at IBP in Perry and was the victim of the grossest race and sexual harassment that I have seen in recent times. So gross that we can't even talk about what they said to her and what they did to her. And the jury, again, looking at that, you know, eight perfect strangers, looking at what happened to her, said, gosh, that's really bad, and we want IVP to stop it. How does what you do on behalf of these women empower women to speak out about the, the troubles in the workplace? The, these women, all my clients, I think, have enormous courage. It takes enormous courage to bring a cause of action and then to go into court before perfect strangers and tell the most intimate details of your life. Very, very difficult to do. Um, I have great admiration for my clients and what they do empowers them personally. For example, Linda um, managed to get through college in a year and is now here with us in Iowa City at the University of Iowa mm -hmm. Law School. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that she was able to do that is even though we haven't gotten any of the money the jury awarded, what, we, what she got was a reestablishment of self-esteem. The jury said, yes, you're right. This was every bit as bad as you mm -hmm. thought. And that helped her to regain her own sense of who she was and who she is going to be, which is a fine lawyer, I'm sure. How does, how does have, for those women, how does having access to the justice system and the courts to get some sort of remedy, how has that changed over time? Do we see employers uh, being more sensitive to these issues um, because of cases being won against companies? I take a very long view. I've been a lawyer for 33 mm -hmm. years. When I became a lawyer, fewer than 1% of lawyers were female. So it's a real long time ago. When I became a lawyer, the idea of women as lawyers was laughable to many people. So in the long view, things have gotten a lot mm -hmm. better. In the short view, I see pretty horrendous things every day. And it shocks me. And I hope, it, I, hope I never lose the capacity for being shocked because these are pretty horrid things that still happen in the workplace. Sometimes with the harasser saying things like, um, you don't think this is sexual harassment, do you? And sometimes the women say yes, and it still doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. So it, it's both better in the sense that women are lots of places women used to not be able to be, and it's worse in the sense that because they are there, they're the victims of, of, of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect that you've provided some advice to companies over time on how to get a handle and, and prevent situations from starting. Oh, I'm always from happy starting. to do that. What, yes. What's a couple piece of, pieces of advice you, you do give to, to folks that are concerned about this in their workplace? To Have a policy, mm -hmm. make it real, write it in language that people can actually understand, pass it out, post it, um, reissue it every single year at least, and follow it. If someone reports sexual harassment, conduct a real investigation, not an investigation to cover it up, not an investigation to make excuses, but an investigation to make conduct that is offensive and illegal stop. Um, I've got three rules. We call them Roxanne's rules for avoiding seeing me in court. And they are very simple. And I offer these to employers as what to tell employees if they're confused about what they can do and not do in terms of sexual harassment. Roxanne's rule number one is, if you would not say it to your mother, don't say it to your coworker. Mm -hmm. Rule number two is, if you wouldn't do it with your daughter in the room, don't do it in the workplace. And rule number three is, if you don't want to see it on the front page of the local newspaper, don't do it, don't say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that will get you out of most situations, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that covers a lot, yes. of, that covers <laughs> a lot of ground <laughs> for just being a good citizen. That's right, exactly so. So shifting a little bit here, we've talked a little bit about some specific cases dealing with sexual harassment. I want to kind of broaden the focus a little bit to, you're also a trial lawyer. 
I am indeed. And been active in the trial lawyers. And, and I know over the number of years, there's been a, you know, tort reform is a term that's thrown around a lot, particularly by elected officials trying to rein in trial lawyers and, and lawyers in general. People sometimes have kind of a bad view about lawyers. They're frequent, you know, you go to any meeting yes, you I want, know. and there's jokes about it. Um, what's the other side of that? Well, the other side of that is lawyers are the people who make the law happen. Um, but for lawyers, and I don't feel very, very necessary usually to defend myself, but I'm not at all adverse to defending others who do much the same thing. We represent consumers. We are the last bastion um, in terms of ordinary human beings, people without money, without access, um, sometimes uh, terribly injured people, injured by General Motors or, or uh, Microsoft or some other huge company. Uh, it is to a trial lawyer that one brings that kind of a problem and that one can expect, assuming that you have a cause of action, that the trial lawyer will take it and do it and, and do his or her very best and perhaps prevail and get to redress for the problems that have happened. One of the ways that happens, as I understand, how the how the is a term called contingency fees. Right. I'm injured in some way, and I believe that somebody else is responsible. Maybe it's product liability; the product's faulty, and I've been injured by it. How does contingency fees work? I come to you and say, Roxanne, this happened to me. A contingency fee is the key to the courthouse for most human beings, um, except for big corporations and others who have lots and lots of money. Because that, uh, I never want to work for people who can afford to pay me. I'm just not interested. I want to work for people who have a cause of action to whom something has happened that I can help with. The people I want to work for don't have any money. And so I am willing to share the risk with them. If they come to me and I think they've got a good case, I share the risk of losing. I also advance costs. Not all lawyers can do that, but there are actual out-of-pocket things that you have to pay in order to get your day in court. Experts, depositions, travel, that sort of thing. And I advance those for my clients because, again, if my client, if I could, had to call my client and say, I need $2,000 to pay an expert's bill, most of my clients would have, they'd probably try to do it. But in order to do it, they would have to take food out of the mouths of their babies, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we just don't do it that way. So that is how people get to court, ordinary human beings, like the women that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. That's how they get to court, and that's how they prevail. Okay. You're watching Iowa News and Views. My name's Joe Balkum. I'm the host. We're about halfway through the program, and Iowa News and Views has a web page, and maybe we could see that address. You can go learn about us, see who's been on, maybe some upcoming topics. We've got a show coming up on uh, the debate regarding electricity deregulation that we taped at the State Fair a few weeks ago, and the, that'll be coming up next. Uh, also, we appreciate all that email we're getting. Uh, our email address is, uh, is going to be up there any second now. Keep sending those email messages on to us about uh, how you like the show and who you like to see as, as one of our upcoming guests. Uh, we're visiting with uh, Roxanne Barton Conlon. She's a trial lawyer from Des Moines. Uh, and has been involved in our state in a variety of ways, including representing uh, women. Uh, as and men. And, and men. Yes. Uh, but I think that because I am a woman and because I have been a woman lawyer almost longer than anybody else in this state, that many of my clients have been sure. women. And, of course, there's so much to do to move um, the cause of women forward that it has given me lots of opportunities to go to court for women. Sure. One of the other terms out there that trial lawyers and the, get beat over the head with sometimes is the whole question of damages and uh, punitive damages in particular, that there's been efforts to cap the amount of money that juries can award in, in, by way of damages. What are the issues surrounding that? Is that a good idea or is that, is that going to prevent people from having justice served? It's a terrible idea. And it is a terrible idea because once you make punitive damages predictable than those who count the beans and not the hearts and souls of people will just figure it into the bottom line. Um, one of the cases that people talk about is, of course, the McDonald's mm -hmm. verdict, which most people, I think, believe is the worst kind of example of a jury gone mad. To me... What was, or, what was the details of that? Well, it's a very interesting case. 
before this 81-year-old woman brought this lawsuit, 700 other people had been seriously enough injured by McDonald's coffee, served at a temperature of 200 degrees, so hot that it could cause a full thickness third degree skin burn in one second. Sounds Not like enough a time. nuclear reaction temperature. Yeah, ap it, amazing, isn't it, that they would do that mm -hmm. and, and, and keep doing it even though people were being injured. This woman did not want to bring this lawsuit. She, all she wanted was for them to pay her medical bill. She was eight days in the hospital. She ended up with very serious um, burns on her abdomen. Mm -hmm. People think she was driving along and uh, spilled on herself. That's not what happened. She was not driving. She was sitting. She was trying to get the lid off so she could put cream and sugar in something that people do with coffee, and it spilled on her and it caused very serious burns. And they refused to, what she really wanted was for them to turn down the heat. And she asked for her medical bills and turn down the heat so nobody else gets hurt. And they said basically, no. So she went to court, they were, they were successful, and the jury awarded one day's coffee profits for McDonald's. I think that's very sensible. Mm -hmm. That seems like exactly mm -hmm. the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And instead, it has created a, a v and, and they did turn down, let me tell you. How much money they, was that? It was about two and a half million dollars. Okay. They turned down mm -hmm. the heat mm -hmm. as a result. So in fact, she accomplished mm -hmm. the purpose, mm -hmm. and it was the punitive damages. Mm -hmm. Even though they were subsequently reduced to um, less than a million dollars mm -hmm. for the total verdict, including the, the compensatory damages, it still made McDonald's turn down their, turn down their coffee. Mm -hmm. I hope they've turned it down in Iowa mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. because that's no, there's no earthly reason to serve a liquid at that temperature. So that jury did, in my opinion, exactly the right thing and got terrible press for it. But that's an example of what happens sure. when you don't know all the facts. Mm -hmm. But punitive damages are absolutely essential if we are to keep corporations on the straight and narrow doing the right thing in terms of safety. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will have no weapon as individual human beings against big corporations um, because if they only have to pay $250,000 or $500,000, mm -hmm. gosh, when you're making that much a second, sure. who cares? You just build it into the cost That's of right. doing business. That's right. And One, jury should be allowed to sure. do what that jury in, in California mm -hmm. did, which was to say to General Motors, my Lord, why didn't you move that gas tank? How could you let this happen mm -hmm. to people? Mm -hmm. And then they saw the document where they figured out how much it would cost them right. to hurt right. people. So it's an incentive for companies to do the right thing as it opposed It is an to incentive. The, necessarily the expedient thing. One yeah. of the areas where this has been discussed is the whole issue of HMOs and who decides what kind of health care you or I might receive. Is it the doctor or is it um, somebody that's in an administrative office somewhere else looking at a chart saying yes or no? Uh, and the question of access to the courts if, you've, if you don't get the medical treatment you, you might deserve. It's a little uncertain here in Iowa whether or not we do have access to the courts. I say we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say we must. Mm -hmm. I say as a, as a constitutional matter. They can't keep us out of court if, in fact, a decision made by an administrator against the advice of our doctors kills us or injures us. But that is not for sure. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. and others need to perhaps be sure that people have the right to bring a lawsuit um, if, in fact, a decision made by an administrator is harmful. Right now, um, I spend a part of every day, and I think lots of doctors are spending lots of their days begging to get treatment for their sick clients. Mm -hmm. It's a very frustrating thing. My own, my, one of my own uh, staff people was in the hospital running a temperature of 103, diagnosed with pneumonia, and they were about to send her home. And I called the doctor, and I said, why? He said, the time's run out. This is my insurance mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. And she stayed for five days. But that is because mm -hmm. we, the doctor cared plenty, and we cared plenty too. But that is not what's happening to people mm -hmm. out there. It's a great tragedy a, and, a, and terrible things. Mm -hmm. People are dying. Mm -hmm. So how big, I mean, it seems like the press, and in, not to pick on the press, it, they just report and what the people 
what's going on, but also what sells sometimes papers. Sometimes they just report and sometimes too. not. <laughs> and we all have the belief that all these juries are awarding all this money all the time. What's the case? I mean, it, is, it seems to me that you've got to have pretty egregious situation Absolutely. to get in a position to get awarded multi-million dollar sure. kind of damage yeah. settlement. It's, it's not everyday occurrence. Well, that's why it's such big news when it happens. Mm -hmm. Mostly, um, cases are settled. People who have good faith and good heart, once they know the facts, can usually find a resolution short of the courtroom. Not in the case of some corporations, huge corporations, mm -hmm. UBS, General Motors, IBP. Sometimes you just have to go and have a jury tell them, that was wrong. Don't do that mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And it is the jury. The, you know, the jury is the last vestige of pure American democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are strangers to the facts. They listen. They decide. And they are the Supreme Court of the facts. Once they decide, as long as it's based on the evidence, that's it. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. And that's why people are trying to mess with it. That's why the, the corporations and insurance companies want to put a box around what juries can do because they can't control the outcome. It's mm -hmm. the only place they can't control the outcome. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to do it by this bad press thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be working. Mm -hmm. What other issues are there for that trial lawyers are concerned about right now? Are there any others that come to mind that We're are on concerned, the top of the list? You know, we are concerned about any time that legislators mess with the civil justice system. Mm -hmm. It was created 200 years ago. It is the envy of the world that we have the right as citizens to take on anybody in court. It's a remarkable thing. And any time that there are attempts to truncate what people can do, it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. It's just a bad idea. We need that jury. Every single one of us has to believe passionately that it is the right to jury trial that protects every other right that we have. Very good. I'd like to shift a little bit and talk about, you've been very involved in Iowa politics and maybe talk about... I'm a Democrat. As a Democrat. That's right. We're both Democrats. <laughs> yeah, figure that full, out. Full disclosure. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, in terms of women being involved in politics over time, um, how do you think that's going? Better. Okay. Not good enough. Uh -huh. Hard still. Mm -hmm. um, there are citizens who believe that women don't have the makeup to be in certain kinds mm -hmm. of positions. Mm -hmm. We've, we see that again and again. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to beat that with a stick. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I think we are seeing women advance. And that's, you know, two steps forward, one step back. It, it, it seems to be taking a very long time mm -hmm. to achieve anything like parity. But again, um, when I started out, there were four women in the Iowa legislature. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Manette. <laughs> and Manette is still there. Manette That's Dota right. From Iowa City. She's doing That's a great right. job still. And, and in the olden days, it was that sometimes it seemed a little bit easier to get things done because no one was paying any attention mm -hmm. to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, things are a real struggle often to reach parity. But mm -hmm. um, I think that we are moving along. I know that you're a part of an effort to try to recruit people mm -hmm. to run for the legislature. And that's a terribly important contribution for citizens to make. To, to self-governance. Mm -hmm. You bet. Um, we have, an, I, I don't know the exact numbers on number of women in the legislature right now, but how do you think having women in elective office, not only at the state level, but local government, we've seen a lot more women elected officials in state or city and county government. How do you think that affects how public policy is make, having, made having more women in the decision-making roles? Well, uh, you know, mm -hmm. women are not fungible and women cover the political spectrum, but women um, are biologically joined and women have a common experience as women and so we bring that to whatever task mm -hmm. we undertake. I don't think women are necessarily sweeter. Certainly people would not say that of me, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but we come, you know, we are the mothers. And so we come at everything mm -hmm. from a somewhat different direction, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. a better direction. And not, you know, and, and we have a whole spectrum of, of political philosophy, but a different direction because our life experience is different. What, can, what would you say to a woman thinking about getting involved Do in it. public life? Do it. Do it. Um, don't wait for something to change. Don't wait for someone to come and get you. Um, 
just do it. If you have a contribution to make, if you have an idea, this is also the state uh, where an individual human being can write you, can call you, can convince you that you should do something mm -hmm. about a problem, mm -hmm. and it gets done. We're so lucky. I see legislative action all around the country, and it's not always like this. But we are still very close to home. Mm -hmm. So I say, if you have an idea, you know, email Joe, but also get involved. Great. That's a great, uh, a great uh, thing to close on. We're actually down to our last minute of the show. Roxanne, thanks for being our guest. Thank you for inviting we've, me. We've learned a lot about uh, the, your role in, in, in uh, Iowa politics in addition to your, your career as a, as a trial lawyer in Iowa and some of those challenges. So thanks for being with us. Thank you for letting me come. You're welcome. You've been watching Iowa News and Views. Uh, my name is Joe Balcom. I'm the host. I'd like to thank the crew for always doing the heavy lifting. Uh, here we are at 67 shows and of course our financial contributors and uh, thank you for tuning in. Remember, this is just a TV program, and what's important to remember is what's going on uh, in your community and how you can be involved in making it a better place to live. So we'll see you again next time.